This session can be called the manifesto of our king, involving, of course, chapters 5, 6, and 7 of the Gospel of Matthew, commonly known as the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, Christ did a number of major discourses, actually four major discourses in the Gospels. The Sermon on the Mount, as recorded in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, which we are calling the Manifesto of the Kingdom. He also did a major series of parables that we'll encounter in Matthew 13. And this is the direction that the Kingdom of Heaven will take after Christ's rejection, which he predicts. Then there's the insider's briefing on the Mount of Olives that that we call the Olivet Discourse, recorded in Matthew 24 and 25, a very prophetic passage, often confused with, but is actually distinct from the similar passage in uh, Luke 21. And then the most intimate of these, of course, is the fourth one, which is done in the upper room. Some people would call it his farewell address, and that's really recorded in John. 14 through 17, and the new relationships that will result because of his death. But obviously, three of the four discourses are in the Gospel of Matthew. And we believe that Matthew had the capability of taking shorthand. He was a customs official. That was a job requirement to handle the commercial transactions they were responsible for. There was a form of stenography, shorthand, that uh, Matthew would have to know. And that's one of the reasons we believe he was able to take these discourses down virtually verbatim. And so we notice that in this, his gospels, the longest of the uh, four, uh, for probably for that reason. And of course, we're going to focus now on the first of these four major discourses, the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Now, this is a strange thing to explore because it is so widely misunderstood One of the most difficult passages to really teach or learn are ones that we think we understand, even though our our understanding may be incomplete or or frail in some way. This is the law of the kingdom. It is the highest ethical teaching in the Bible. We're going to discover it's far higher than the law of Moses. It goes vastly beyond the uh, law of Moses. The Ten Commandments which are a subset of the Law of Moses, are taken and expanded and amplified. You thought the Ten Commandments might be tough to follow. When Jesus threw with them, they're out of sight, at least out of reach for most of us. I would say all of us, except unless you understand the dynamics. So this sermon will raise the law to the nth degree, and we need to understand why and what, what's going on here. It's the longest discourse recorded in Scripture. And notice who it's addressed to. It's not addressed to the general public. We'll discover it is addressed to believers. There probably were, in the back fringe, some Pharisees and Sadducees that Jesus insults terribly. He gives anybody that's Jewish that understands what he's saying will be in utter shock before we're through here. This sermon would be a condemnation to the unsaved. It presumes that you're saved, and it lays on some additional perspectives here. It's interesting that in this entire sermon, there is no visible path to salvation mentioned. You're really left with some huge problems. In fact, you can regard it in one sense as a statement of the problem, for which, of course, Jesus Christ is the solution. No gospel of salvation is discussed here. Let's just understand that up front so we don't misunderstand what is going on. This presents ethics, the highest ethics in the Bible, on the one hand, but without supplying the dynamic to meet those ethics. They're presumed, in a sense. Romans chapter 8 summarizes it. Paul in Romans chapter 8 says, For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. Why? That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. And that's what this is going to dramatize. 
You really won't understand the solution until you really understand the problem, as we might say in, in, a, in a laboratory course. The manifesto of our king. It's in three chapters. Four major relationships are laid out. The relationships to ourselves, the relationships to the law, our relationship to God, and our relationship to others. And the first two of these, to the self and to the law, are covered in the first of the three chapters, chapter 5. And uh, that will be the subject of this session. Our subsequent session will deal with chapters 6 and 7. Matthew chapter 5. The first 16 verses of Matthew 5 describe the, two, the uh, true Christian and will deal with character. The rest of the Sermon on the Mount, after those first 16 verses, deals with a conduct that grows out of the character. Understand the distinction here. The first 16 verses describe the character of the Christian, and the rest of it deals with what should flow from that character. Character always comes before conduct. We need to understand that. We live in a society that has disdained character. We have disconnected, in our society, we disconnected character from destiny. It used to be there was at least the myth that you embraced that, gee, if you had led a straight life and worked hard and kept your nose clean, you would amount to something. Not today. Today, the presumption is that you, you, you have to cheat to get away with it. That's in every, you see that in so many different forms. Character always comes before conduct because what we are determines what we do. Character is what you are when no one's looking, somebody once put it. What's the difference between character and integrity? We use those terms a lot, don't we? He's got integrity. He's got character. Integrity is simply belief plus the discipline to follow through with that belief. It isn't necessarily a good belief. Whatever it is, though, integrity assumes that you, you're, you got it together. What you believe is accompanied with discipline. Integrity is the vertebrae of your soul, in a sense. Character comes when you take that integrity and add to it wisdom. The, the, the integrity is a basis, but not enough. Many Christians have real problems because they don't have any integrity to begin with. There's a, there's a concept of discipline involved that many of us try to uh, uh, elude. And what kind of wisdom are we talking about? Well, that's where Proverbs, our famous verse out of Proverbs 9, verse 10 comes in. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of holy is understanding. The knowledge of the holy. So that's where we're headed, gang. Matthew 5, first 16 verses, Jesus shows us what, that true righteousness is inward. It's inside. That doesn't, shouldn't come as a surprise. I think most of us would check that off on an exam and understand that. But the next, the rest of that chapter, he points out that sin is also inward. Both true righteousness is inward and sin is also inward. And thus he exposed the false righteousness of the Pharisees. And there's Pharisees of all kinds in all societies. We'll talk a little bit about the, who they were historically, but they were the law keepers. Form rather than substance. The Pharisees taught that holiness consisted of religious actions and that sin was what you did outwardly. They focused on what you could see and measure rather than what was really the source inside. The form rather than the substance. Matthew chapter 5, what we might do here at this point, I'd like to read through um, the chapter and then we'll go back and start analyzing it. Let's just, let's just read through it. Matthew chapter 5 beginning at verse 1. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him. Notice who's coming. His disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed be the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. 
Ye are the salt of the earth. But if the salt have lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out and be trodden under the foot of men. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Think not that I come to destroy the law or the prophets. I come not to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one yard and one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. And whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Wow. Ye have heard that it was said by them of old, Thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you, that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of, judge, of judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath ought against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. Agree with thine adversary quickly, while thou art in the way with him, lest at any time the adversary deliver thee to the judge, and the judge deliver thee to the officer, and thou be cast into prison. Verily I say unto thee, thou shalt by no means come out thence, till thou hast paid the uttermost farthing. Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. If thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and, that, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. It has been said, Whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. But I say unto you, that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, cause a third to commit adultery, and whosoever shall marry her that is divorced, committeth adultery. Oh boy. Again ye have heard that, is, it, that it hath been said by them of old time, Thou shalt not forswear thyself, but shalt perform unto the Lord thine oaths. But I say unto you, Swear not at all, Neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, neither by the earth, for it is footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Neither shalt thou swear by thy head, because thou canst not make one hair white or black. But let your communication be yea, yea, nay, nay, for whatsoever is more than these, it cometh of evil. Ye have heard that it be said, an eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you, that ye resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, Turn to him the other also. And if any man shall sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. Give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn not thou away. Ye have heard that it been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, pray for them that despitefully use you and persecute you that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven, for he maketh his Son to rise on the evil and the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. For if ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same? And if ye salute your brethren only, what do ye more than the others? Do not even the publicans so? Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. Wow tough chapter. And if you didn't pick up some of the other tough stuff, that last verse should disturb you. I'm tempted to ask for a show of hands. How many of you are perfect as your Father in Heaven is perfect? 
Tough stuff. What's he saying here? Well, the first group, of course, you're, you're well familiar with. They're called the Beatitudes. And uh, it's, it comes from the word uh, blessed, the Latin blessed, Beatitudes. But it's also a B-attitude, in effect. See, the Lord did not actually give the Sermon on the Mount to the multitudes. He gave it to his disciples, those who were, were already his. So that's the foundation that we're working on here. They were recognized as a, the listener here was recognized as a citizen of heaven. That's what he's laying out. What are the requirements for citizenship? You're a citizen of heaven. Here's what to be expecting. And notice their, 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 their be attitudes, not do attitudes. He doesn't say do this or do that. He wants your conduct to flow out of your innermost being. Be these things, and the rest will take care of it. The Ten Commandments, all but one, are really external things. Thou shalt not steal. You can tell if someone steals. Thou shalt not murder. You can tell if someone murders. They're all, all but the last one, the covets is another area, but are really, don't deal with intent. They deal with something you can bring before the bar of justice, something that's, oper- that's, that's testifiable to, if you will. He's talking about a whole different thing here, much deeper, much, much more condemning. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him and said, he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed be the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, and so on. The Beatitudes, poor in spirit. What on earth does that mean? Let's take a quick snapshot, and then we'll go into each one in detail. Our attitude towards ourselves is in view here. Our attitude towards ourselves in which we feel our need and admit it. The poor in spirit recognize that we are, left alone, spiritually bankrupt. We need to understand that. Our attitude towards ourselves, the poor in spirit. Blessed are those that mourn. That's our attitude towards sin. We're not talking about somebody mourning at a funeral. We're talking about someone mourning, he's talking here, that's in true sorrow for sin. Meekness, there's a word that's often misunderstood. It's our attitude towards others. We have to be teachable. We don't defend ourselves when we are wrong. That's what meekness involves. Hunger and thirst after righteousness. Here's our attitude toward God. See, each one of these are attitudes. Attitudes that we are to be. Not things to do, things to really be. Hunger and thirst after righteousness. Their attitude toward God is expressed uh, in this. We receive His righteousness by faith because we ask for it. We're thirsty for what? For food and milk? No, for Him, for God. That's what's in view here. Merciful. We have a forgiving spirit and love others. Pure in heart. We keep our lives and motives clean. Holiness is happiness to us. There are no, and we accept no substitutes. The peacemakers. We should bring peace in two different directions. Between people and God, first of all. That's the critical one. And also between those who are at odds with each other. That's the one we can probably relate to first. But it's the other one that's primary. To, to, to bring peace between people and God. And then, of course, the last one's on persecution. And understand that all of us who are living godly lives will suffer persecution. So the first one is poor in spirit. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We must be empty before he can fill us. This is the opposite of self-sufficiency. We're in a culture where we strive to be self-sufficient. And in a certain pragmatic sense, there's a utility there. But what this is talking about is the opposite of that. Our sufficiency is not of ourselves. If we think it is, we we haven't even got to first grade yet. The world promotes self-sufficiency. Yet God dwells with the person whose heart is broken. You hear this um, strange, perverted proverb, God helps those who help themselves. That's not at all. That's not biblical. God helps those who come to the end of themselves. And virtually almost every story in the Bible exemplifies that very issue. And by the way, this does not mean a false humility or cowardice. Uh, It means a proper attitude towards self, realizing how weak and sinful we are apart from Christ. 
We should be reminded of Luke 18. You remember the, the Pharisee who prayed on the street corner so everybody could see how religious he was in contrast to the publican that quietly in the privacy zone said, God, forgive me for my sins. Right. And uh, so this is in contrast to the Mosaic law. Joshua was told when the people of Israel came over the Jordan, they were to stand on two mountains. They divided the nation in two parts. Before Mount Gerizim, where they read all the blessings, and Mount Ebal for the presentation of the curses, if you recall that. The blessings from the Sermon on the Mount are in sharp contrast to the curses from Mount Ebal, and they far exceed the blessings from Mount Gerizim. If you look at the, 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 those, those two presentations, um, that's, that's all there is in this, in the, in, as far as the Mosaic Law is concerned. This one goes far beyond those in blessings and in sharp contrast to the curses. Very different. And the reason is because Christ alone can bring these blessings. Christ alone can bring these blessings. So we're dealing here with the manifesto of the king himself. Okay, from the poor spirit, we go to they, they, blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. He's not dealing here with mourning in general, like going to a funeral or something. This is for, uh, alluding to a sincere sorrow for sin. Our sin and also the sin of others. If you want to understand how spiritually mature you are, a lot of people say we're striving for spiritual maturity. Well, how do you measure that? One way you measure that, how much do you hate sin? When you begin to hate sin as much as your father does, that's progress. We need to understand the awfulness of sin. And we get so careless about it. We make jokes about it. We excuse it. We make humor around it. We're all guilty of that from time to time. Yet God hates it. Sin breaks God's heart. Can you imagine how much the Father must love you to stand by and watch his son spit up on, abused, tortured, crucified? Can you imagine as a father? He hates sin, and that was the price, so that he could make room for you and I to have fellowship with him. Beware of the sorrow of this world. It's a different kind of sorrow they're talking about. Peter mourned with godly sorrow and was forgiven when he, he, he mourned that he denied Christ and Christ forgave him. Judas had remorse, the sorrow of this world, and he took his life. Be careful of that kind of mourning. It's dangerous. Micah is an example of those who mourn and are comforted. Micah chapter 7. You can read it at your, put it in your notes and read it at your leisure. Okay, let's go to the next one, the meek. Meekness is not weakness. Many people misunderstand that. Jesus was meek, yet he drove the changers from the temple. Moses was meek, yet he judged sinners. He even faced Aaron, his brother, with sin. So he was meek, but that didn't mean he was weak. Meekness means not asserting my own rights, but living for the glory of God. You can't live for the glory of God without some backbone, some strength, some willingness to stand up when the time comes. Meekness is not weakness. Meekness really derives from its priorities, from its focus, putting God first. Christians are to show meekness. And Ephesians 4 and Titus 3 uh, deals with that. Emphasizes that. You want to be so good that you've got nothing to prove. You've all seen those situations. There have been entertainments and dramas built around someone that can stay understated, that he exercises his gifts when the occasion really justifies. And uh, you want to be so good that you have nothing to prove. We find this in Psalm 37, verse 11. 
By the way, the meek are not inheriting the earth today. Have you noticed? So what's this all about? The manifesto of the king that we're dealing with is the way it's going to be when he's running things here. Is he? Not yet. We've got an usurper on the throne. Who's the god of this world? Yes, but his days are numbered. The meek are not inherit. I mentioned this not for the meekness issue, but so you get a perspective. There's something much broader here than many people realize. The meek will inherit when Christ is reigning on the earth. Well, let's go to the next one. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. A true Christian can be measured by his appetites. Ask people what they desire, and you will know what they are like. Character is what you are when no one is looking. I had to throw that in. I like that. This is evidence... There's, this is evidence of your new life in Christ. How do you know if you're saved? One way you can tell is by checking your appetites. What do you hunger and thirst after? You've got a free afternoon by some sudden cancellation. You suddenly have a couple of hours at home uh, without uh, any other agenda. What do you reach for? To read. Do you read your Bible? Do you pour into some new commentary? Do you dig into something having to do with Him? Or fill in the blank. Of course, the natural man will have nothing of this. 1 Corinthians 2.14, Paul reminds us, The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. That's the way you can tell whether you're really saved. Are you still in the natural, or are you drawn into, attracted into spiritual things? The Sermon on the Mount, as you'll begin to realize, is not a recipe, it's not a formula of what to do, it's a description of the problem that we face. The solution to the problem is Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. But until we really understand that we have no chance of even coming close to uh, dealing with a problem without the Holy Spirit, without Jesus Christ, we're still in... We're below level one, okay? We haven't gone on. Okay, let's go to the next one. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. The merciful. This is not legalism. Merely the working out of the big biblical principle of sowing and reaping. You will reap what you sow. So that's, <clears throat> if we show mercy, because Christ has been merciful to us, then mercy will come back to us. And Luke 16, and... and uh, there are, other, there are other examples of that, of course, in Scripture. You cannot earn mercy, but you must have a heart prepared to receive it. That's not automatic either. Titus tells us in chapter 3, verse 5, Not by works of righteousness have we done, but according to His mercy He saved us by the washing of the regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. 1 Peter 2 but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. We should be constantly aware of the fact that our existence uh, is from, is the, has the benefit of his forgiving us. We forgive others because... We, not to earn somebody else's forgiveness. We forgive others because we're conscious of how much we've been forgiven. Boy, I have to remind myself all of that every once in a while where I'm really upset with something and I just have to stop. Wait a minute. I am the beneficiary of so much forgiveness from my father. I have no room to be uptight on subject X. That, 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 that's a <laughs> frequent occurrence. Okay, blessed are the merciful. Let's move on to the blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Pure in heart. Not, we're not talking about sinlessness now. We're talking about truth within. And uh, David prays that in Psalm 51. And John writes about it in his first epistle and so forth. 
It means a single heart, not a divided between God and the world. Pure in heart. Think of it as singleness of purpose, singleness of commitment. God is not just number one on a list of ten. He's number one on a list of one. That's the concept that we're talking about here. Pure in heart. No honest man can say that his heart is pure. How can the heart of man which is desperately wicked be made clean? Jeremiah 79. Our heart is desperately wicked, Jeremiah tells us. The word actually in the Hebrew is incurably wicked. Nowhere in the Bible is a heart made clean. That idiom is consistent from cover to cover. Forty different guys writing 66 books over thousands of years, none of them fumbled that idiom and said that he, 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 he has, he's got uh, a, his heart's been made clean. He's given a new heart. Give it a new heart. Create in me a clean heart. That's me giving you a new one, not repairing the old one. It's irreparable. That's the point. The Lord Jesus said, Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. By the washing of the regeneration that we are made clean. Only the blood of Christ can cleanse us from all sin. That's the real point in 1 John 1.7. Well, let's move on to the next one. Blessed are the peacemakers. We're not talking about six guns here. As he mentioned peacemakers, some people have a different idea. For they shall be called the children of God. The world is at war. And I'm not just talking about geopolitics here. Far more dangerous. You see evidence of the warfare I'm talking about in the geopolitics. When you see the legacy of hate that spans generations and cultures, you find these cultures who hate each other but are united in their hatred of Israel. You know there's something supernatural going on there. Christians have the gospel of peace on their feet so that they, wherever they go, they bring peace. That's one of the elements of the armor of God. One of the things you need to do if you haven't done it is go to Ephesians 6 and study the seven elements that make up your armor. Understand what they are. Understand that you better have them on because you are in the battlefield. One of those is the preparation of the gospel of peace. And this is not peace at any price. Holiness is far more important than a peace based on sin. That peace has to deal with the sin issue. And compromise is not peace. Christians should not be contentious as they contend for the faith. So on the one hand, you don't want to compromise. On the other hand, you don't want to be contentious. There's a very, very prayerful balance there. And God hates discord. Proverbs 6, we talked about that. We went through Proverbs. God hates discord. The Lord loves peace. Romans 14 and 15. And there's no one today who can make peace but Christ alone, the great peacemaker. He made peace by his blood between the, a righteous God and an unrighteous sinner. And things which are not of peace, you can find in Galatians 5, 19. These are, these are, these are things that are the kind of things that are not peace. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Get ready for the list. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and the like. Of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in the past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Boy. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, continuing, the, 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 blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And then it goes on to amplify that. We should be accused falsely. He's not talking about where we deserve to be persecuted. Okay? He's assuming here that if we're accused, it's falsely. We should never be guilty of deliberately inviting persecution either. If we, live, if we live godly lives, persecution will come. But I want you to notice the rewards of all this. We will be in the same company as Christ and the prophets. We'll be rewarded in heaven. Scripture uses the term the metakoi. The other term it's used in the Greek is the koinonos, 
the partakers, the participants, they're the ones that are going to be rewarded. Will there be, now this, this whole thing which you'll dis- discover, the whole meta- meta- uh, manifesto of the king focuses on when Jesus is ruling on the earth. We call that the millennium. Well, wait a minute. You mean there's going to be persecution in the millennium? That sort of shatters our conceptions, many of us, right? The many scriptures show that in the millennial kingdom there will still be evil in the world because it's still a time of testing. Man will be without excuse. Satan's bound. And there's no shortages. There's no, no shortage of the knowledge of God. There's no shortage of needs. There's, it, it, it's a time of perf- ideal world. And yet, given a chance at the end, man will still rebel against God. The outbreak of rebellion at the end of the millennium reveals that evil will be prevalent during the millennium. And this will not be laid at Satan's feet. This is man's own in, in, in genetic defect called S-I-N. Well, let's continue. Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to the, be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. Salt was a preservative, especially in those old cultures. It preserves materials from corruption, but it's also, it creates thirst and it introduces flavor. All three elements have their spiritual analogy, if you will. Salt speaks of the inward character that influences a decaying world. And our task is to keep ourselves pure that we might salt this earth and hold back the corruption so the gospel can get out. It's that simple, that straightforward. He goes on, he says, Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid, neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Light speaks of the outward testimony of good works that points to God. That's one way of trying to bring this into focus. Our good works must accompany our dedicated lives as we let our lights shine. See, we we weren't told to witness, we were told to be a witness. Big difference. You didn't, there's no, there's no uh, instruction to be obnoxious. (laughs) We are to be a witness and the rest will take care of itself. Oh, these two verses, are they pivotal? These are pivotal. Think not, Jesus says, think not that I, am co- I come to destroy the law or the prophets. I come not to destroy, but to fulfill. Boy, we need to understand that. Many people don't. New Testament Christians who disparage or ignore the Old Testament don't get it. People who go the other way to the Messianics and try to put themselves back under the law don't get it. The balance is between the two. Jesus says, For verily I say unto you, when he wanted to emphasize something, he said, I say unto you. When he wanted to really emphasize, he said, Verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one yacht or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Ooh wee. Now, if you take a Hebrew word, this happens to be yod the, the, the unpronounceable name of God in their, in their minds, a yot is the little, one of the 22 Hebrew letters that you and I would mistake for an apostrophe. A tittle is, are the little diacritical marks that give the vowel sounds, little, little often not even written sometimes in, in, in unpointed Hebrew writing. But the point is, these are, intended to be, these are equivalent to you and I talking about the dotting of an I or the crossing of a T. This is a call. Verse 18 is a call by Jesus Christ to take the text seriously. I would like to say take the text, the text literally, but then people stumble over figures of speech. Because there are figures of speech in the Bible. We need to understand the rhetorical devices. But clearly God means what he says and says what he means, and this verse is one of those places that anchors it as far as I'm concerned. Fulfilled the law. Jesus fulfilled the law. He did it in three ways. He filled it by obedience to the law. And Isaiah 42 verse 21 celebrates. He fulfilled the law by his death. He met the claims of the law for us. He didn't need to die, but he did for us on our behalf. He died so we don't have to. Romans 10 4. And he also fulfilled the law through the Holy Spirit. He enables the believers. He fulfills the law by providing the Holy Spirit to, to, uh, to give us the dynamic, dynamics we need to meet the law. 
There's a hermeneutical insight here, a call to taking the, serious, the Scripture seriously. Nowhere in the Bible is there any example of someone reading the Bible allegorically. There are allegories, but every place you see someone reading the Bible and doing something, you'll notice the context, they're taking it very literally. When Daniel's reading Jeremiah and Daniel 9, and there's other examples. But let's move on. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments... Boy, there's a big issue. What commandments is he talking about? He's not talking about the law. He's talking about his commandments. We're going to discover that he is asserting himself as the lawgiver and the interpreter. He makes reference to the old law that he's fulfilled. He's laying down some new commandments. Who shall break one of these least commandments shall teach men so, shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you, I say... He's not, this isn't Moses talking now, or one of the prophets. This is God himself. Jesus says, For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. I want you to appreciate what a shock that must have been to a Jewish audience. Because they were surrounded by these professional law keepers. And these guys were serious. You can disparage them to say things about them, but boy, they went to the letter of the law. That was their life. That's what they did. To a Jew, that was the high ground, those guys. And for Jesus, and they're probably standing in the back row in this presentation. And he's saying to the public, except your righteousness exceed the, right, the, the righteousness of those guys, you don't have a chance to stand in the kingdom of heaven. That didn't win their hearts, of course. <laughs> But it also made a telling point. To a Jew, he must have been re uh, really confused because that was the standard. And you got to beat that to get to heaven? Man. The Pharisaical error. The scribes and Pharisees were not insincere. They tried to adhere to the keeping of the law. They may have been misguided, but they were zealous and they were sincere. Anyone who tries to reconcile himself to God by his works, his rules, or his legalism is Pharisaical. And that's us too. We have our rules. We have our little things that we think, that uh, uh, our little do-gooder things. And if, if we try to if we're doing those to reconcile ourselves to God, we are in big trouble. That means we do not understand the completed work of Jesus Christ. It's blasphemy. Are we trying to add to what He completed? That's called blasphemy. Let's be careful here. Is there any other way to heaven? other than by Jesus Christ? That's a question we need to have no doubt about. If there is any other way to get to heaven but by Jesus Christ, Jesus' answers to his prayers, he didn't get his answers to his prayer in Gethsemane. In Gethsemane, he prayed three times with such earnestness that a doctor reports that he sweated blood. That was Dr. Luke that makes that remark. Jesus was serious about it. He did it three times. If there's any other way, let's take it. Nevertheless, not my will but thine be done. So if there's any other way for someone to get to heaven other than by the cross of Jesus Christ, if there's another way somehow, that prayer wasn't answered. Now what commandments are we talking about here? What are these commandments that are being referred to? The ones we find in the remainder of this chapter and continuing chapters 6 and 7. You need to understand that. We'll call that, for lack of another term, the law of Christ. Paul did. Jesus is going to emphasize all through this passage, my commandments, my words, etc. It's very personal. First person singular. Not Moses' law, Christ's law. And he has... A call to obedience. In the modern church, we tend to ignore that. John 14 is full of that. 1 John 5 is emphasized. It goes on and on. He, the call to Jesus Christ, is he has fulfilled the law for us, but he has called us to obedience of his commandments. We need to understand that. In, in the, when we get to chapter 28, the last chapter of Matthew, he's going to give us what we call the Great Commission. Everybody hears, heard of the Great Commission. Let's look at it more carefully. Jesus came and spake of them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and on earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the 
name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to what? To observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Amen. What things are we supposed to teach? His commandments. We need better understand what those are. Uh, all those that I have commanded you. Does the Christian have to keep the law? And when people say that, they usually mean the law of Moses. The fact of the matter is, the law is still today a standard. Because it reveals to me that I cannot measure up to God's standard. I couldn't do it in the raw, as was written by his finger in stone back then on the mount. I certainly can't with this reinterpretation by Jesus Christ, which raises the bar even higher. Get the picture. Tough stuff. This is intended to drive us where? To the cross of Christ. We need to fall down before the cross. The only way I can fulfill the law is by accepting the only one who could fulfill it, Jesus Christ. The good news, and that's why we call it the good news, is that he's done that. You won't find the good news within the Sermon on the Mount. It sets up the problem. The good news is the solution. The good news is Christ has done it for you. But there's some things that go along with that. Jesus, he fulfilled the law several ways. He became our sacrifice, shed his own blood, his own sinless blood on our behalf. He offered himself once and for all for the sins of mankind. And of course, the scripture is full of those references. You can dig them out of the notes if you want to track them down there. Everything was fulfilled just before Jesus' death on the cross when he uttered his last words. They're recorded in John 19.30, it is finished. What he said, what's recorded in the Greek, is one word, totelestai which can also mean paid in full. Paid in full. We'll come back to that before we're through here. The second way he fulfilled the law is that he, is that he taught and commanded what God's will is under the new covenant for those who would enter the kingdom of God. We are under a new covenant. That's why we call it the New Testament. Many people know that old, they don't know why is it called the Old Testament, New Testament. Because we are under a new program. God gave a set of rules to us. Paul called these rules Christ's law. Not Moses' law, Christ's law. Some of these are the same as God gave in the Old Testament. Many were changed, but most of the Old Testament law was not included at all in Christ's law. Wow. There isn't 613 commandments in Christ's law. There's all kinds of things that he did not talk about. Interestingly enough. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth, Paul says in Romans 10.4. Christ is the end of the law. What does that word end mean? It's telos. It means end, termination, goal, culmination. It's the limit at which a thing ceases to be. The last in any succession or series. It's fulfillment. That's what the word telos means. That's where we get teleology and some of these other, other terms are built from that Greek term. Christ is the end of the law. Um, Galatians 5.18 But if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. He is our peace who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace. Colossians 2 you, and you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out, ooh, the handwriting of the ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. He's speaking figuratively here. But the idioms that he's drawing on, if you were convicted of a crime in the old world, you had a debt to society. That was actual document. Your debt to society. And when you, let's say you were sentenced to five years in prison, that debt that you had to pay was given to the jailer. And he'd keep track as you knocked off one year, two years, whatever. Let's assume in the third year you somehow escaped. The jailer would have to pay the two years that you slipped out from under. That's why the jailer, when, in, in Acts, when he, they were all open, he was ready to kill himself because he thought they'd all escaped. He said, don't do that, we're here. Blew him away, he became saved. But the point is, when you finally finished your sentence, let's assume you've been five years, you're five years went by, you would get that document back and it would be stamped across to telestai, paid in full. And you'd keep that as your protection against double jeopardy, that you'd never again have to serve 
payment for that crime. Do you follow me? That was that, that's the way the thing worked. And that's what Paul is drawing on here, blotting out the handwriting of the ordinance. This is called, another way to call it, our certificate of debt. We, you and I, have a certificate of debt that was against us, which was contrary to us. It was taken out of the way. He nailed it to the cross, is the way Paul is expressing this. Terrific. That's you and I. 2 Corinthians 3, for as much as we are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone. What's he referring to here? What law was written in tables of stone by the finger of God himself? What? Ten Commandments. Paul is drawing a contrast between the law it was commonly thought of, that written not with ink, our, our, the law for us is the epistle of Christ ministered to us, Written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in the fleshly tables of your heart. And such trust have we through Christ to Godward. Not that we were sufficient of ourselves to think any such thing as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of what? Of God. Not in tables of stone. Second Corinthians 3, 6 and 7. Who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. But if the administration of death, written and engraved in stones, and he goes on. Again, he's drawing contrast to the Ten Commandments as exemplary of the Mosaic law. That's not what's condemning us. We're not under that law. It's been done away with. We're under a different situation altogether, and that's to be walking by the Spirit. Ten Commandments were the ones engraved in stones, of course. We were released from the law, according to Romans 7, first two verses. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over man as long as he liveth. For the woman which hath a husband is bound by the law to her husband as for as long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. He's drawing an analogy here. So if then her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from the law so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. So you get the picture he's drawing here. It's like a last will and testament. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit to God. So when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin, uh, the motions of sin which were by the law did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. And on it goes. What was the law for then? Through the law we became conscious of sin, Paul tells us in Romans 3. The law makes us clear. We begin to understand what sin is. It gets worse than that. Why was the law given? This is, Romans 5.20 will shock you. If you haven't done a careful study of the book of Romans, when you get to the 20th verse of chapter 5, it'll hit you right between the eyes. The law was added so that trespass might increase. The law was given so that sin would increase. You've got a brand new lawn and no one's bothering you. Put a sign, keep off the grass, and what'll happen? People start walking across it, right? I mean, there's, a, there's just something about our nature. Law was added so that, trust, that we might, that, that, that sin would become more evident, really what he's saying. It was added because of transgressions until the seed, that is the Lord Jesus Christ, to whom the promise referred had come. The law was put in charge to lead us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. That's what the law is for. Now that faith has come, we are no longer under the supervision of the law. That doesn't give the license to sin, but it means that we're not under those rules and regs and so forth. Ye have heard that it was said of them of old, Thou shalt not kill, Jesus said. Whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of judgment. But I say unto you, you notice he's putting himself above Moses here. That's subtle, but you need to recognize it. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And I might mention, by the way, that without a cause is argumentative. There are some scholars that believe the Greek doesn't say that. There's a debate about that. It doesn't really matter, except you realize that's not really out. There is such a thing as righteous anger. You can get into a whole study on there are places. Jesus got angry. There's a place for that. And that's what this is intended to convey. But at the same time, if you're angry with your brother, the without a cause is, uh, is not in some manuscripts, and there's uh, some scholastic debate about that. Anyway, shall be in danger of judgment. Whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, uh, thou fool, in other words, uh, 
shall be in danger of the council, and whosoever shall say thou fool shall be in danger of the hellfire. Um, the, um, so angry, being angry is murder in your heart, is what it's the basic concept. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there remembers that thy brother hath ought against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way, and be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. That's pretty straightforward stuff. Agree with thine adversary quickly while he, thou art in the way with him, lest at any time the adversary deliver thee to judge, and the judge deliver thee to the officer, and thou be cast into prison. Verily I say unto you, thou shalt by no means come out thence until thou hast paid the uttermost uh, farthing. It's interesting, all the way through here, you see Jesus saying, I say unto thee. He's lifting his authority above Moses and is acting not only as the lawgiver, but the interpreter of that law. We need to recognize what he's really saying to. They pick that up near, at the end. You'll see that when we get to the end of this. Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. And obviously actual adultery is far worse than infil, uh, inward uh, fantasies. But still, these fantasies and desires can cause an injury to your own psyche and it can also lead to the forbidden sins. And so we've got to be deal ruthlessly with this sort of thing. Can't feed on these things. You need, and uh, we're going to talk, uh, uh, he touches on divorce here. We're going to talk about that when we get into a study on Matthew 19. But let's move in here. If thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out, cast it from thee, for it is, if, if, if it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee to, that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. And uh, you can decide for yourself whether Jesus thinks you should run, run around chopping off fingers and things, but uh, I think but he's indicating that it's serious stuff. We need to take him seriously. It has said, Whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorce. But I say unto you, see, he's going above Moses again, that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, cause her to commit uh, adultery, and whosoever shall marry her, that is a divorce. Uh, uh, Commit the adultery. This is expanded on in Matthew 19. We, we won't take our time here tonight. Again, ye have heard that it hath been said by them of old time, Thou shalt not forswear thyself, thou shalt perform unto the Lord um, thine oaths. But I say unto you, Swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, neither by the earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. You know, it's interesting. You can go into Leviticus 19, 12, and Deuteronomy 23, 23, and see how they... Uh, uh, how they get around these things. Uh, the, the Jewish legal experts really spent time uh, finding loopholes and ways to skirt the letter of the law so that a, word's, a person's promises would do nothing. Jesus will deal with that when he talked when, uh, with Corban and some of these other subjects that, that uh, he, he attacks that, that superficiality. But this is, neither shalt thou swear by the head, neither because thou canst not make one hair white or black, and so on. Um, but let your communication be yea, yea, or nay, nay, whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. Every time I see this verse, I'm reminded of an occasion when I had a VIP tour of Bell Labs, one of the most distinguished research organizations in the country at the time. And uh, the telephone community, of course, is an analog community. That's the, you know, they have a long tradition because it's from Graham Bell and on. But digital techniques were just beginning to come into vogue. And in this tour, we had one of the department heads that was in charge of the digital thing opened his talk by pointing out that when you're a digital group in an analog company, you want to make sure what kind of a mandate you've really got. And so he says, my mandate comes from Matthew 5, 37. <laughs> it says, let your communication be yay, yay, or nay, nay. Whatsoever is more than these is of evil. In other words, he said, that, that's digits, ones and zeros, no, no in, in between. So that, that's call for digital communication. And I cracked up. The, the audience laughed and went on. I, 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 I was amused that at the head, the head of the major department, Bell Labs, would use the scripture as his mandate for his digital engineering. But anyway, we'll move on. Uh, Ye have heard that, that it hath been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. That, incidentally, is called lex talionis. It's the, the law of retaliation. You'll find in Exodus 21, verse 24, eye for an eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand. Foot for foot, burning for burning, wound for wound, stripe for stripe is the way it goes. It's a retaliation thing. But Jesus says, But I say unto you that ye resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on the right cheek, turn him the other also. And if any man shall sue thee at law, take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. Lex talionis, the law of retaliation. 
Interestingly enough, the law of Moses really prevented a people from taking the law into their own hands and seeking private revenge against an enemy. It also kept magistrates from issuing exorbitant sentences that did not fit offenses. If you get into Leviticus 24, you'll, you'll, you'll see, the, see that spelled out. But uh, I don't think... Uh, so Jesus asks his people to suffer rather than to cause others to suffer is really the, the spirit of what he's saying. Here's the Leviticus passage. If a, if, if a man cause a blemish in his neighbor and, as he hath done, so shall it be done to him. Breach for breach, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, as he had caused a blemish in a man, so shall it be done to him again. If he that killeth a beast shall restore it. He that killeth a man, he shall be put to death. It's interesting that capital punishment isn't just allowed, it's in, insisted upon in the Scripture. But that's a whole other study sometime. Ye shall have one manner of law as well as for the stranger, uh, uh, and uh, as one for your own country, for I am the Lord your God. Leviticus 19 says, Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thy heart, thou shalt in any wise rebuke thy neighbor, and not suffer sin upon him, thou shalt not avenge, nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. Notice what we have here, This what Jesus identifies as the second great commandment, is tucked away in, Luke, in uh, Leviticus 19.18. Exodus 23 also gets at this sort of thing. If thou meet thine enemy's ox or his ass going astray, thou shalt surely bring it back to him again. If thou see the, the ass of him that hateth thee, lying under his burden, and wouldest forbear to help him, thou shalt surely help with him. Okay, let's move on. Uh, whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. You see, it's in, there was a rule by Roman soldiers that one, uh, they, they could force you to take them a mile. That was the legal allowance that they could invoke that, that, that much. And uh, so he's given here not the Roman law, but the kingdom law. And uh, it, it's, uh, give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow thee, and tur turn not uh, thou away. So it's, it's again the spirit of the thing. Ye have heard that it hath been said, thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, pray for them that despitefully use you and persecute you, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh... His son to rise on the evil and on the good and sendeth his reign on the just and on the unjust. Pretty straightforward stuff. But then the reasoning continues with Jesus. He says, If ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans do the same? I think this is pretty interesting. There is obviously the, the general population disdained the publicans, the tax collectors, because it was a form of franchised stealing. Because they could collect what they wanted to. They bid the job from the Romans. So it's like a franchise that just encouraged corruption. So they were, the publicans were hated. They were like collaborators with the enemy in the eyes of the Jews there. Well, what makes this remark kind of interesting is Matthew's profession was a publican. He was a tax collector. And here he's, he is acknowledging or using the fact that the publicans were the lowest level in their society in the minds of the audience here. Do not even the publicans do the same? If you salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Do not even the publicans so? Here twice they're used as, a, as the, the lowest of the low here. And Matthew himself is recording this. You know, I love that. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Boy, that's the indictment. That is the terrifying verse at the end of this, that if nothing else got our attention, that one should have. Be therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. Nicodemus was an outstanding man, major teacher. He was religious. The family of Nicodemus were the ones that negotiated the, with the Romans at the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD. These were powerful people, powerful, powerful families. And uh, Nicodemus was a, was a heavy. And he was, and he was religious, very devoted. You cannot find much to criticize Nicodemus by doing all the searching you want. But the Lord said to him, you have to be born again. See, that wasn't good enough. John 3, famous, famous passage. You and I have to have a righteousness superior to that of the scribes and the Pharisees, but it can only come through Jesus Christ, by trusting Christ. Well, in our next session... Before we get into our next session, I encourage you to read through the three chapters that we're dealing with. If you get a chance, I also encourage you to read John 17. 
That's the real Lord's Prayer. We're going to encounter what's called the Lord's Prayer, which is not the Lord's Prayer. It was a model prayer given to the disciples. That's never mentioned anywhere in the Scripture, by the way. It was just a model, something to follow. The Lord's Prayer is intimate uh, discussion with the Father is in John 17, the night of his betrayal. And you, you, you want to you contrast those two. And if you get a chance, read through the book of Galatians. If you've got to hang up on this law thing, I encourage you. Galatians is a, is a sort of a nice little summary of the book of Romans, but it really focuses on the issues we're talking about. If you want a perspective of the law, 